Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's learning session, Local Participation in Red Plus Measuring, Reporting, and Verification, organized by WWF Forest and Climate. Thanks for taking the time to join us. My name is Emmeline Gasparini, and I am a program associate with the Forest and Climate team. Today, our presenter is Manuel Boissier from C4. Uh, next slide, please. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few logistics and some frequently asked questions. For those of you who have participated in past sessions, this will sound familiar, but yes, today's presentation is being recorded, and you can find the recording within a few days on our YouTube channel. To get to the recording, simply go to youtube.com and search for WWF Forest and Climate. There are two audio options. You can listen through your computer or dial in through the phone number that was provided in your registration email. It's important to note that if you experience audio difficulties while listening through your computer, those are sometimes caused by having too many browser windows or programs open at once, so feel free to close some of them, which usually solves the issue, or you're always welcome to join by phone. If you continue to have technical difficulties, please send me a message via the chat area and we'll try to get you sorted out. Questions are absolutely welcome. You can send your questions anytime during the webinar using the toolbar on your screen. We will answer as many as possible during our allotted time, and if we have a lot of pending questions after our time is up, um, I'll follow up with uh, Manuel to see if we can get some of those answered in written form as well. After the webinar, you'll receive a link in your follow-up email with additional forest and climate resources from WWF, including a link in the YouTube channel where you can watch a recording of the session. Thank you again for joining us, and with that, we'll get started. Next slide, please. And Manuel, take it away. Thank you, Evelyn. Evelyn um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night uh, to all of you who are listening. Uh, so my name is Manuel Boissier, and I am a scientist from CIRAD. CIRAD is a French agricultural research center for international development based in France, I, as you can guess in, from my accent. Uh, and I am seconded to C4, the Center for International Forestry Research. I'm based in Ethiopia, and uh, I apologize if uh, internet uh, can be an issue. I hope we won't be uh, interrupted during this presentation. So my presentation is about uh, the potential role of local people in climate change mitigation, in particular through tropical forest management. Uh, so we'll talk about RED, RED plus, and RED plus for those who don't know is reduction of emission from deforestation, forest degradation, but it also includes uh, sustainable forest management, forest conservation, and enhancement of forest carbon. So if you have a project on these issues, on uh, uh, the contribution of forests to mitigation, and if someone is talking to you about the role of uh, involving local communities, you will say, yes, of course, it's obvious, we need to get co local communities on board. Even the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention, Convention for Climate Change, consider local participation as an important step uh, towards recognition of local people's role and safeguards. And it's also to build a system that will be strong, that will provide uh, good information for the greater good. But the greater good is not, is not necessarily the good of local people. And if the local people interest is not secured, then the system that we are trying to build with them uh, may not be sustainable. Next. So the objective of this presentation is to share uh, project results on finding the conditions for feasibility and sustainability of local participation to Red Plus measurement reporting and verification for forest management and climate change mitigation. This project was funded by USAID and NORAD and was implemented by C4 in collaboration with CIRAD. Next. So first, what is MRV? What is measurement, reporting, and verification? Actually, each country that signed agreement during the COP uh, has, a, has a target uh, in limiting or reducing the emissions of carbon, and it's called NDC, the Nationally Determined Contribution. And we need a system to monitor uh, the achievement from each of these countries. So MRV represents that system. 
and it stands for measurement, reporting and verification of what? Of the carbon stocks or carbon emission in each of the country. But also it helps to monitor red plus implementation. So it's in its uh, governance aspect, for example. Uh, so how the, the red implementation is structured within a country and also the financial aspect. So it's a tool which is a monitoring tool, extremely important for red plus credibility. You cannot implement a program on reducing emission in the country uh, without having this monitoring tool to check if actually you achieved what uh, you committed for. Next. So measurement, what does measurement mean? So if we look at uh, uh, guidelines from UNFCCC, they propose a tier approach to measure or to assess carbon. The first tier, the tier one, uh, is very global, it's very general. It's about uh, assessing biomass of forest biomes all around the world. Uh, the tier two is more country specific for forest inventory, but we are more interested in tier three, which uh, represent in-depth and repeated tree measurements, also using remote sensing. So it's kind of monitoring aspect based on uh, data from the field. Next. Reporting is, well, you have data, you measure trees, biomass, you, you get information about rivals of deforestation or forest degradation at the local level. You need to provide that data to the higher level, to the national level first, so to be embedded in this national greenhouse gas inventory, but also to the international level when, where agreements are, are being signed through so the UNFCCC. Uh, so that's a reporting part. Next, verification is about uh, verifying if uh, a country has achieved its commitment. And in general, it's done by an international external body that is sent by UNFCCC uh, to check that in, at the country level. Here, because we are talking about more the local level, the project level, where uh, which interacts more with local communities, I would prefer to talk about validation instead, instead of verification to avoid confusion. Next. So that was about the definition of MRV, for those who don't know. Now, what is participatory MRV, participatory measurement, reporting, and verification? Well, actually, it's to involve local people, local communities in the measurement, reporting, and validation of carbon stocks on one hand, and of other non-carbon data that are required to assess the impact and co-benefits of RED+. When we talk about non-carbon data, it can be, uh, well, drivers of uh, deforestation and forest degradation. It can be a social safeguards, so how uh, um, an action has an impact on the local livelihood. Uh, next. And from the literature, so there is quite a literature uh, on that topic. Uh, from the literature, what are the claim benefits of PMRV? There are many. Uh, they are supposed to build and support social capital and engagement, to empower local people, to improve local livelihoods, to reduce forest degradation and, and deforestation, and even, uh, so there is a long list here, and even to provide monitoring at a low cost compared to monitoring that could be done by uh, experts. But there are few evidences of such benefit because there are few experiments on the long term about engaging local communities in such me measurements. Next. We, uh, so at C4, we developed, we, we conducted this project called PMRV project. It was in Indonesia. project is now finished. Uh, so in which, during which we, we looked into the feasibility and sustainability of engaging local communities in uh, forest management and uh, more specifically uh, MRV. So we worked in three provinces in Indonesia and seven villages uh, and we tried to use a gradient, a gradient of forest cover, a gradient of uh, uh, population density and of economic pressure. So, for example, from the right side of uh, the map, uh, we worked in Papua. We had several sites there. 
where the natural forests are still very big, the human population is low, so the human density uh, is, uh, is low. Uh, there are more and more economic pressure from private sectors like uh, logging companies or, or plantations, uh, industrial plantations, but uh, not at, uh, at the level that threatens this, this uh, huge uh, piece of forest. On the contrary, on the bottom left uh, of the map, uh, central Java is, is all the contrary. You have no more natural forests, all the forests are planted. Very high density of population, it can be more than 1,000 per square kilometer. Uh, and um, when the networks, the roads, uh, internet is working very well there, on the contrary of Papua. West Kalimantan, um, the top part of the map is a bit in the middle where it's a mix of between plantations, natural forests, a lot of, uh, of uh, economic pressure and a population density which is a bit between. So that was an interesting uh, sample uh, to compare how people will react and how interested they would be in participating to, to an early. Next. So, uh, my presentation is based on uh, the work on, uh, on this PMRV team from C4. I want to say a few words about them because they, they are composed of brilliant young scientists from very different disciplines, remote sensing or GIS, uh, social science uh, and even health. Uh, and without them I couldn't report uh, any of the results of our research. Uh, we published several articles in a collection, a special issue of PLOS One. Some are published, some are going to be about to be published. And for most of these, uh, these scientists, these, these are uh, first publications, so I'm very proud of their work. Uh, from this collection, so there are five issues that need to be considered uh, for participatory approach to MRV. First is the stakeholder in involvement who should do it. Uh, second is the motivation, so local communities be part of this, yes, but what is their motivation? The third is about knowledge integration, especially how high-tech uh, can play a role into that. Uh, then fourth is multi-level governance, especially important when we are talking about reporting, about bringing this information collected by local people at the local level to national and international levels. And fifth is social safeguards, so how um, Red Plus or any activities we can have at the local level can impact local livelihoods and how can we prevent from negative impact. Next. Some results so from this project, uh, from this C4 project here is just to say a few words about this picture. This, was taken in one of the village uh, of our project in uh, West Kalimantan and you can see here a very uh, diverse mosaic of uh, land use in, in this landscape. Uh, next. So first about stakeholder engagement, who should be part of this PMRV? Next. So the usual suspects first are the trained professional. Indeed, they are important to check the credibility of what is measured, how it is measured, the scientific credibility, how it, what what the data, what kind of data is is provided to this national database. So trained professional are necessary, but also governments because governments will have to integrate all this data on forest biomass, on drivers of deforestation, of, of degradation, on changes in the local livelihood to the national level, to the national database, where they are in charge of that. They also have to validate uh, this data to report them to the higher level, to the international level. Then the NGOs, the NGOs are close to local people. Uh, normally they are working in villages or near villages, so they are very important to make the link with local communities and they have a big role in facilitation. And of course local people. Local people, why? Because they have a local knowledge of course of land use change and they are very close to the forest and the trees that we care about. Next. Second is about motivation. Motivation of local communities to participate. Next. Uh, local people will participate to in MRV only when first it matters to them, so it needs to be relevant to them, 
And secondly, they have time because most of these activities of patrolling, of uh, reporting, of contributing to uh, taking part into meetings, that takes time and it's very far from their normal livelihood activities which in these areas are about farming, fishing, hunting, etc. Next. We lack concrete examples on the long, of the long term PMRV for carbon, for forest inventories uh, involving local people. It can be at the at the, um, during the life of a project, but the, when the project is finished, it's rare for that uh, monitoring activities to continue. But we have other examples, and that's one thing that we, we studied during this project. Uh, it's about a highly motivated PMRV, not related to forest, but related to health in Indonesia, so this children and maternity health monitoring. When in for a very long time, we will talk a bit more into detail later, but I'll explain a little bit. For a very long time, uh, women uh, in, uh, in each village of Indonesia are uh, monitoring the health condition of newborn, of pregnant women, and reporting that to the higher level. And we asked them, we conducted several uh, in-depth interviews in each of the village uh, where we worked and we asked about what is their motivation to do so and uh, so the, the results were this. First for personal interest because uh, most, a lot of these person are pregnant women so taking part of these activities or a young mother. Uh, second is that they believe, genuinely believe that this will benefit to the community uh, to contribute to this activity. Uh, and then another one is they were requested or asked by respected people, person in the village to contribute to that activity so they cannot escape from, from that uh, responsibility or duty. So this is uh, really interesting because that was very obvious for this health sector when on the other side we had a study on the forestry sector and that was much less obvious. Uh, local communities in the, in the forestry sectors will, will, be, will get engaged in monitoring activities and reporting uh, crop, crop or timber production or whatever to the forestry sector but only if they are paid or if they have a direct interest and that interest was not obvious. Next. Uh, but we identified um, uh, different source non-financial motivations uh, to participate to MRV uh, in this village where we worked. And one of these uh, motivators uh, is land tenure. So we think that's, that's quite an important issue, so I would like to spend some time talking about it. Land tenure security especially could work really as an incentive for participation in MRV because in a lot of uh, sites where we worked, people felt unsecured uh, regarding their land rights and negotiating more security. So that's, that's a big topic. I will just uh, briefly talk about it. The negotiating about, about uh, bigger, more security in, uh, in land rights could be an incentive for them to participate in MRV and, and red activities. Land tenure also could be important for benefit distribution uh, of PMRV activities when there is some in financial incentive to distribute then where to whom and how. So uh, how the, the land tenure is organized in, in the village can be helpful to, to that. And then it will inform also about a different source of authority statutory or customary for conducting MRV. If you want to conduct any activity in the village, you don't just go to that village, talk to the head of the village, get his authorization, and then that's it. You do conduct your activities, but you have to understand how the village is structured, who are the different uh, customary leaders, and uh, how the village is shared, so the land tenure, and to what clan is responsible, who has right on what part of the, of the territory. When you go to conduct activity there, you need to secure uh, authorization from these people. Next, so to talk about a bit more into detail about this tenure arrangement, 
Um, I would like to share some examples from our three sites uh, about the complexity of antenna arrangements. And I think that was really surprising to me to see how different it can be in three different sites but in the same country. And I think if we chose another province it would be probably different and I'm sure that uh, if you are uh, in, in the place you are working elsewhere in the world you will, feel, you will find very different antenna arrangement. So here uh, on the left, the left figure is about Java sites uh, where you have very simple antenna arrangement. Uh, so the, the, the figure is simple. Uh, the big frame is a village boundary and then you have two uh, different kind of, uh, of land, the non-forest estate, where the village settlement is uh, located, but also where people have private land holdings, where they grow, where they are doing agroforestry, growing Albizia especially. Uh, and then the forest estate. The forest estate is not natural forest, as I said in my previous slide, but it's plantation, especially tree, tree, uh, pine tree plantation uh, by uh, state-owned a company and in this forest estate local communities have, a, have some land use, you know, use uh, rights, use rights, so they can grow crops in this forest as long as it doesn't compete with uh, the growth of the trees, uh, but uh, they cannot develop a grow forestry like in, uh, in near the village, uh, the settlement boundary. So this is very clear here uh, all is documented, uh, is legally recognized, uh, you have uh, land rights certificates issued, so that should be the most secure place uh, in all our sites, but villagers in these sites felt, still felt insecure because they had to fight to gain these rights and, uh, and they, they fear that it may change anytime. Um, the second one in, in the middle one in, in Kalimantan is much more complex. So you have again this uh, non-forest estate which is smaller and the forest estate that includes a big uh, area which is a uh, logging concession. The logging company is not active anymore but in terms of tenure it still applies that it's a logging concession so people cannot do anything uh, as they want in that, in that area. Uh, in the non-forest uh, estates so or in the village settlement, uh, per se, people develop um, they develop individual gardens with private ownership, which is regulated at the village level. Uh, but in the forest, they develop also uh, agroforest and big gardens that uh, overlaps with the timber concession. And this, uh, this uh, garden, this agroforest, uh, can be managed by individuals, families, or by the piece of the community or the entire community. Uh, on top of that, you have all these dots all around the territory, which represents, uh, which figure trees, uh, individual claims on trees. So there are trees which are important economically and owned by a family or by a person. And that can be trees that uh, host honeybees, for example, or important uh, fruit trees such as uh, jackfruit or durian. So that's, that's quite complex. The one on the right side is very different in Papua, uh, the last figure, uh, where the non-forest estate is very small, uh, where you have a, the, the village settlement, and the forest estate is quite big, and it's very large territory. It's especially uh, included in the, in the protected area. So villagers have uh, individual gardens in the, in, near their settlement, and uh, in the forested part, they will, so it's natural forest, they will also have uh, big uh, sago groves that can be individually or in family clans or at a vi village uh, owned. Uh, Level. What is interesting here is that as when you go further from the village, so on the border near the boundaries of the village, you have overlaps with other village territory. And here the land use right near the border is more flexible. Uh, villagers from each side allow village villagers to hunt, to fish, and to extract timber or NTFP. 
so in, in either territory, they don't say this is my territory and you need to get out. So that's quite interesting, with different approaches. And I think when we develop an activity uh, including involving local people, we really, really need to know more about this, uh, this tenure arrangement. Next. So now uh, about the contribution of technologies. Next. Uh, when we talk about high-tech used for PMRD, we can talk about web database, for example. Uh, GPS and smartphone that can be used by local communities to record changes in the landscape in the forest cover and remote sensing. Next. Input from uh, local people can improve the accuracy and the, and the accuracy of maps developed using remote sensing, for example, and also the understanding of uh, the drivers of deforestation. So later I will show you quickly three examples uh, of this. Next. Uh, technology, on the contrary, can produce meaningful tools for local people. For example, uh, maps developed using remote sensing can be used by local people to negotiate land use and strengthen their land rights. So I remember one example in, in Papua, in Indonesia, where villagers were asking us uh, to develop with them, to help them develop uh, maps of their territory in order to negotiate their land rights with neighboring village, with uh, government at the district level, or even with uh, logging companies operating in what they consider being their territory or boats crossing their territory and to which they wanted to ask for compensation. So that can be useful for them. Next. But the problem when we use uh, technology high tech in remote areas is that tools are fragile, they are expensive, they need maintenance and you need to bring someone. Sometimes it's quite remote and, uh, with an area with difficult access. They need capacity and they need infrastructure. In some areas where we work there is no 3G, uh, so no internet, uh, sometimes no electricity, no, not even uh, phone network. So it's very difficult to use uh, these, uh, these tools in, in such areas. Next. So, the free example I wanted to stress about how local knowledge can contribute to uh, maps developed using remote sensing. Uh, here you have on the top left a uh, remote sensing map of land cover in one of the sites where we worked and uh, with a different so, the types of land cover. On the right, uh, top right, is the same map that developed with local communities, the so participatory map. Um, I must precise that the base maps uh, for these two maps were the same, but uh, then to develop them we use the local knowledge or the knowledge from uh, GIS experts. On the bottom part is when we overlap these two maps and the red uh, spots show uh, mismatch between uh, the map from developed using remote sensing and the one only and the one using uh, participatory uh, mapping, sorry, participatory approach. So this is not to say that one way is better than the other, that uh, one is wrong, one is right, but it's more when we, are, when we want to do some validation, uh, verification, when we want to do ground check, uh, instead of doing ground check randomly or ground check according ecosystem, we could look into uh, these red spots and, and check only the, those parts to, uh, to improve these maps. That's one example. Next. The second example is what uh, local people can provide in terms of information using participatory map of land use on the left and of land cover on the right. So in land use you have uh, an enormous quantity of information that community, local communities can provide and that are very difficult to get using remote sensing only. Uh, on, when we talk also about land cover, local communities at the scale of a village territory can go much more into detail. Uh, for example, they can differentiate a uh, small rubber plantation of different age, something which is more difficult to do using remote sensing if we don't use uh, very, very expensive and high-tech uh, remote sensing. And next. 
The third example is about uh, land use land cover dynamics and their historical change. So that's very important. Uh, when, when we look at a map of a land cover at a certain time, uh, that represents sometimes the addition of many years generation of land use of that area. And villagers can provide detailed information on the history of the current land use and land cover. So in the, in the figure uh, on the right, you see so the numbers are the location of the same village but that moved in during like the last 30 or 40 or 50 years. Uh, the number one is the first uh, village location and they, they move, they split in two villages at some point, so the two, number two, and then they uh, merge again in the final settlement, the current settlement, which is the number three. And you see the area delineated by the dotted line uh, show how the land use, which was hunting, gathering, gardening, how did it move uh, with the time? So it's important to have uh, this understanding to interpret uh, land cover maps uh, at the present day. Next. So now about the reporting aspects. Uh, so, okay, we know that we could technically, and there can be some interest negotiating and some motivation of local people to collect information on forest cover, on uh, drivers of, uh, of uh, deforestation at the local level, but how to provide, to bring that to the national level, and what role could be for local people in reporting, and that role is until now not very clear. Next. So, on top of that, when there are, there are data collected by local people, this data need to be uh, standardized in order to be embedded in the national database. You need the same kind of data everywhere in, at the country level, uh, otherwise it would be a total mess. Uh, so one of the papers we had uh, suggested that an external facilitator could play that role in aggregating and reporting the data, like uh, NGO, which is regularly in contact with local communities. Next. Another paper, which was not part of uh, our project from Pratia Astana over uh, in a different country, uh, next please, suggested that to use a simple online system, so like web database, that might facilitate near real-time reporting and aggregation. So that needs, that's supposed to have this PDA, this smartphone, uh, for local communities and to have enough uh, internet so for them when they embedded information in, in their PDA it would be automatically downloaded in a, the website. So that's a solution, why not? Another one, next, uh, is based on this healthcare system that I was talking about, uh, so uh, which was very successful. I will talk a bit more about it. Next, please. So this healthcare system has existed for a very long time uh, in Indonesia. And for me, that's, that's a very successful reporting system. So it existed since the 80s in all the villages in Indonesia. And local communities were, so as I said before, organized to monitor health conditions of uh, newborn infants and pregnant women. And uh, so villagers were involved, working together with nurses at the local level, and they would use whatever tool, high-tech, low-tech they have. So if there is internet, they use smartphone, and, and they re reported to the district, which reported to the province, to the national level, all this data on, uh, on uh, young uh, newborn. Uh, and if there is no uh, no high tech available, then they will write it on paper and bring it uh, by boat to the district whenever they can. Uh, so that's very interesting because it works. It reaches the national level and it uh, leads, guides health policy at the national level. For example, uh, if uh, there are issues of malnutrition, that will trigger action from the national level. Uh, to help at the village level with very specific village. Next. Uh, 
Well, so we talked already about the motivation for people to take part of this, but we didn't talk about what incentive they can get. So the first incentive we found uh, to contribute to that system is the recognition from the community and higher level in the system, which are the health uh, administration at the, at the provincial and national level. Uh, so recognition of a contribution. Another one is they will benefit some time of training programs on health issues. Uh, and the last one is financial incentive. It's not very big, sometimes it's like $20, $30 per, uh, per month, but in villages where it's very difficult to get any cash income, it can be something significant. Next. The last, uh, last part is about social safeguards. So any activity uh, that we are doing on MRV and PMRV requires social, social safeguards. So the first thing we need to know is that local people have really limited interest in red plus carbon monitoring per se. If I was asked to do that in my village, I, I don't think I would be really interested. But next, but they have the experience, they have the skill and most importantly, they have interest in observing uh, how the forest is changing in their territory. Next. So this assessment gained not only from the understanding of change and drivers of change, next, but also uh, from the understanding of the importance of this process for the local people. So when we say an activity, uh, we identify an activity which is we, we, which uh, degrade forest, which trigger, which is a driver of deforestation, we need to understand how important it is for local people. Next. And any action uh, collected from uh, RED uh, plus activity program implementation to reduce deforestation and deg forest degradation should focus on options with less negative impact on local people. Next. So I will talk a bit more about this, how intervention should take into account the local livelihood. On the uh, upper right part of the slide, you have different uh, extractive activities that may be source of uh, degradation and deforestation. So rubber, sago garden, uh, shifting cultivation, timber and artisanal gold mining. And then the pictures you see show each of them. So from the top right to the bottom left, you have uh, rubber tapping and then uh, seco extraction, shifting cultivation, extraction of uh, timber, I think it was in Java, and uh, gold mining. So the figure shows in, with uh, X uh, axis the percentage of households involved in these activities. Uh, the color represents the activities and the square, a small square, represents each of the village. The Y axis represents the contribution of these activities to the household income. So uh, the higher is the more important in the household uh, income. So what can we see from this, from this figure? Uh, if we look at the quadrant one, for example, we will have a number of activities, of extractive activities, which are uh, implemented by a very big proportion of the households in the village and which are source of a major uh, cash income for these households. So if we have an activity that will, an intervention that will impact, uh, that we try to change these, uh, these activities, we need to be very cautious because the impact on local livelihoods will be important. On the other side, the quadrant four shows activities which are conducted by very few uh, amount of household and that uh, don't uh, provide a lot of income for these households. So maybe that's something to, to look more into. And this, for this is for cash income, but we could also develop this kind of, uh, of uh, figure for source uh, of food, for example, for these households. So I think knowing this can be quite important when we have a project with interventions planned. Uh, next, uh, in conclusion, so what are the potential and challenges of developing this participatory MRV? First of all, wishing uh, for more engagement of local people in Red Plus MRV is good, but it's not sufficient to make it happen. Next. 
to be feasible, PMRV needs next to have the local people on board. And that's easy to say, not easy to implement because MRV is very technical and it's still too far from local people concerned. So we need to make sure that it also contributes to uh, local forest management systems. Uh, next, PMRV also needs to use local ecological knowledge and technical capacity, especially for collecting all these non-carbon data, like uh, these drivers, what are these drivers of uh, deforestation and forest degradation, what are uh, the impact on uh, local livelihood. But we need, uh, that, and that's a challenge, to use the same standards across sites. That's not easy to achieve. Next. And then PMRV needs to develop appropriate reporting structure using successful uh, examples from other sectors. So we saw, I gave you some exa an example from the health sector, how it shows promising uh, success, but there are other sectors, non-forestry sectors that can be interesting to study. For example, education, when data are also uh, um, reported from local to national level. So that could be also something interesting to study. Uh, next, uh, last PMRV needs to develop fair validation system in which there is a role for local people. It's not just about asking local people to do something, to do measurement, to measure biomass, to provide information on uh, on uh, to provide information on drivers of, uh, on how the, the forest cover is changing, but it's to getting them all on board, otherwise we are just not trusting them by just checking if they are doing a good job. So they need to play a role in this validation system and it's probably the most difficult part of developing this PMRV. Uh, next. So here I'm talking to all of you who have projects, call it research project or red uh, implementation in the field and who are planning to involve local communities into this activity. I really recommend you to do first a feasibility study before anything uh, to confirm first if local participation is needed and sometimes it's not needed, uh, if it can be secured, uh, considering how appropriate, how important it is, it can be for local communities, and to select approach adapted to a local context. Uh, next. So the next represent posters that we developed during uh, the project to explain our concepts to communities. I don't think I will, uh, I can talk to you about it if you're interested in the Q&A later. I think that's, that's it, next. Yes, thank you, Manuel. Thank you very that was much. fantastic. Um, really, really informative. Um, so, participants, this is your time now to send questions in through the toolbar function on your screen. Um, I have one that I'm going to start off with, um, but please feel free to send those along, and we'll make sure Manuel answers them um, as many as possible. We've got about 15 minutes left, so. The first question I'm going to put to you is, how can local communities enrich their traditional forest management practices and systems by incorporating participatory MRV innovations? Well, yes, I, I hope I, I at least partly answered that question with my presentation, especially when I provided the examples of uh, how uh, mapping that we are using for this PMRV uh, can be useful for local communities to negotiate uh, land management, their land uh, rights uh, claim, uh, and with other village, but also with uh, with the local government. So I think by doing that, uh, and we saw it in the field that there was a real interest for this. Uh, we can provide information that are useful to local communities and that can be incorporating in their in their management system. Fantastic. Um, I have someone asking if there is a published method to MRV and the social benefits of red. So I, I think they're asking if there is a manual of some kind that you know of. 
for MRV totally. You, know, you, you go to the GovCGOAT uh, published by IPCC, UNFCCC, you have a, you have a lot of methods. Uh, for PMRV, you have methods, uh, but most of them, as I said at the beginning of my presentation, focus on engaging local communities in the measurement activities. So, what kind of training do you need? How often do you need to do that? And uh, what kind of tools, equipment do you need, etc. The problem is there is very little methods on, on how to, uh, to develop a reporting system uh, by getting the local community involved in that system and, and for the validation also. So in our website, in uh, the PMRV website, I think you have it after uh, in, in the presentation, uh, you will find a lot of, uh, a lot of information uh, that we, we produced. It's not a guideline how to conduct PMRV, but it's more uh, uh, reports, publications, and all results that we could have, and all the methods we develop to study this uh, this feasibility of PMRV. We were really working on, on feasibility here. Not we didn't conduct a PMRV per se. Thank you. Is PMRV being formally included into Indonesia's Red Plus MRV system? Uh, I don't think so. The Red Plus uh, so has, has uh, embedded social safeguards uh, into their system, so that's something they, they are really developing something uh, that tries to take into account the impact of Red Plus on local livelihoods. But I don't think, to my knowledge, that officially there is participatory MRV uh, embedded into a national official system. And, uh, and with, uh, with a method that will be standardized for all Indonesia. Okay. Do you happen to know of any other countries where participatory MRV is being integrated into the national MRV system? Uh, not to my knowledge. I know that where I am working in, in Ethiopia, uh, we had many talks with the Red Secretariat here and they really want to embed that in their system. So they are working with NGOs who have developed pilot uh, activities on that. Uh, but I think uh, until it becomes something official, uh, the, the, the road is still very long. And uh, maybe some of the participants uh, could uh, provide me with more, more information, more experience on a system that has been officially recognized at the, look at the national level and, and, and applied everywhere in the, in the country. That would be very interesting for me to know. But as far as I know, no. I think there are examples of, Kenya, of Tanzania where you have really monitoring activities from the local level that reach the national level and that works very well for many years. But I'm not sure we can talk about PMRV in that case. For Red Press. Okay. Um. Uh, someone is asking how you use smartphones um, in the mapping. So can you explain a little bit more about maybe one or two examples of how you used technology in these yeah. projects? Yeah, so I, as I said, uh, that part was not part of our project. It's, uh, it's a method that was developed by someone called uh, Arun Pratihast, and I put the uh, uh, the name uh, on that slide. So it's a different activity uh, during his PhD in, uh, in, uh, in Netherlands where I try to see how this kind of tool can be used and, uh, and how people can be trained to, to use it. And uh, using smartphones, regularly going to check if everything uh, is going well with a very simple system. Uh, to detect changes in the landscape, to make pictures, uh, and with a GPS coordinate. And when people are clicking on it, it goes directly in, in, uh, in a database that uh, was developed by that person. So I think the best to have more detailed information would be to read uh, his paper first, his papers, because there are several, and, um, and, and to talk to him directly.
In our project, we used, uh, because that was really a research project on feasibility, so feasibility study, we used high tech, but uh, we were the one using it and providing like maps on the paper or uh, satellite uh, image to local communities in order to talk with them about their, uh, the, the forest cover in their territory and how it changed and where and then going with them, uh, doing ground check. And we were the one using the GPS mostly, most of the time. So because that was a research project, it's a bit different. But uh, by doing this and using the smartphone uh, in the WordPress project, I think from that publication of uh, Dr. Pratihas, you will have much more information on how it can be done and what are the limits of this approach. Thank you. Um, is there an optimum size of local trained people to um, assist in, M in PMRV or is it just however many people you can um, include? This, uh, I don't, I don't think it's about the size uh, of a uh, like the number of people who could be engaged in this activity, but it's more about the size of the territory we are talking about. Uh, for example, when we were working in central Java, we would have uh, a village territory which would be a few hundred hectares. So it's not very big and, uh, and with thousands of people in it. Uh, but in Papua, uh, so in Indonesian uh, New Guinea, uh, one village territory would, uh, could be a million hectares for one village. And you would have in that village a few hundred uh, people uh, living in it. So how, the, the problem is not how many people you need as a minimum to conduct participatory MRV, but more how many people do you need to conduct MRV in territories that can be very big and, and, and so part of it uh, pretty inaccessible. Uh, so not after like a few weeks of, uh, of using a pirogue or, or walking. So I think this is where this collaboration and this participation, like, like at the beginning I was talking about who are the stakeholders and, and experts should be part of it because this is a mix of what we can provide using remote sensing, GIS, so all the technology that we can put into the, the balance and what local communities can provide uh, with all the knowledge they have of their territory. And that's the combination of the two that can provide information in very large territories. So the problem is more the size of the territory than the size of the group involved in the activity. Thank you just searching through questions to find the next one. Um, did you experience any difficulties um, regarding the educational level of local people in incorporating them into these PRV programs? So, once again, that was a research on PMRV. So, we didn't really conduct uh, PMRV with villagers, training them to use tools and uh, to uh, to report. But we can during the the different household surveys that we had, we conducted uh, a survey of the education level and to see uh, what was how many people were. Uh, graduated from high school, how many people were from uh, elementary school and uh, how many people were, were illiterate and uh, we tried to compare within the, the different villages but because we didn't conduct an, an, an MRV activity with them it, it would be hard to say why it works the most. Uh, what I can say is the, the motivations uh, could differ among the village uh, according to the level of education they have. Uh, and uh, for example, in Papua villagers uh, there were some of them going to the university uh, in the, the province town, uh, were really very, very interested in knowing more about what is carbon, why are you, that was one of the posters I showed briefly at the end, why are you coming here and talking about carbon when we cannot see it, what is it, can we touch it, can you explain about it, and they would condition their participation to our activities and the answer they will have, they will give to our questionnaires and interviews, 
to our explanation about what, what actually carbon is. And that, that was quite an exercise for us to explain it simply uh, with, uh, with some text, but as much figure as possible. And uh, I, I think it was a good in, uh, exercise even for us. Thank you. Um, in terms of the local governments in those places, did you have conversations with any representatives from those institutions or those um, structures about whether they would be interested in supporting PMRV in their you know, districts or provinces? So, um, to not be, because we are doing a feasibility study of PMRV, to not be influenced by uh, red implementation, we chose a location where there was no red program actually. So in each of the sites, all of the people, especially local people, heard about it. But uh, so to to embed PMRV, to to start using PMRV, you need first to have like this idea of. We need to have information on how the forest cover change, and you, because we are going to implement uh, a red intervention in that in that uh, area. Uh, see, this is something we didn't do, but we secured, of course, uh, authorization from all the levels of the government, including the local, and we explain uh, our ideas. And I think we 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 had quite a lot of interest from the from each government. Uh, at the end of the project, we produced um, a report in the Indonesian language that we shared, we sent to, to each of the organization, governmental and non-governmental organizations and villagers uh, to know more about uh, our achievements and what we found. Uh, now will be the next step, uh, which means we have information on, in these particular areas, uh, how could MRV be developed under what condition. And the next step is if a red project is coming, then uh, that will be to use this information to see really if we can engage local communities in such a scheme, in such a approach, participatory approach. Okay, so if a country is already engaged in the preparatory phase of Red Plus, it might be worth investigating whether they would also like to implement PMRV as part of that process? Yeah, and I, I, I'm I'm sure that they would be interested. Uh, not only because this is a more and more a requirement from the UNFCCC, so each country involved engaged in PA, in in Red Plus needs to think about how engaging and how securing uh, safeguards for local communities. Uh, so that's that's one point. But also, uh, yeah, I think they they uh, see uh, potentially the cost of such approach. They see that they need to get the local communities involved in order for this approach not only to be successful in the short term but to be sustainable in the longer term. And without the local communities, I I think it will be very difficult and very costly. So. I would think that most of the countries engaged in Red Plus are interested by this participatory MRV, uh, but being interested in what it is one way uh, is one thing, but implementing it, uh, putting it into practice is another one. And uh, local communities could totally think that, uh, local community, local governments could totally think that, uh, oh yeah, we just need to ask local communities to measure and they will do it and, uh, and uh, everything will be fine. It's much more complicated than that, much more complex as I hope my presentation showed. Yes, um, I think you did and you did a very good job of explaining clearly how complicated the process is but how important it can also be. Um, well, we also come to the end of our time today, so I think I'm going to have to send you some questions for follow-ups. Um, Jenny, if you would change the slide, please. I want to thank you, Manuel, for sharing your expertise with our community and to thank the participants for joining us and for sending in your thoughtful and engaging questions. Everyone will receive a follow-up email in a few hours with some additional resources that are specific to this webinar. And um, I just want to point out that if you would like to request a copy of the presentation, you can email Manuel directly. Um, and he also has a lot of really great resources on the C4 site. So that's why those links are up there. I, don't know, I want to direct participants there as well as a really great 
um, source of information about participatory MRV. Uh, next slide, please. If you want to revisit this webinar or share it with colleagues, the recording will be up on the Forest and Climate YouTube channel in about a day or so. You can also find recordings of previous sessions there for additional enrichment. Next slide. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope you all have a wonderful day.